Testing, one, two, three. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Temple Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for January 31st, last week that we missed. This is take three. I usually do these in one take. Uh, the audio was bad on the second take and the uh, the video was bad on the third on, on this one. So now we're gonna do it again. Um, as you know, we've been dealing with this uh, idea of spiritual disciplines and uh, we're moving into session two, which is uh, the title of it's knowing God. Um, the point, of this lesson is our hearts are satisfied as we encounter God through His Word. Okay. Well, I immediately took issue with the title of the lesson and the point. They didn't seem uh, to match. Okay. Uh, and then when I looked at the scriptures, I couldn't get the. I couldn't really get the connection of what uh, the author of this lesson was really trying to make. Well, I got the connection. I mean, I finally got it, but I didn't agree with it. But anyway, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word, God. Uh, I prayed over this lesson about five times so far, so God, I just ask you to bless it. God, bless the, the study of your word. Bless the hearers, God. Uh, I pray your spirit would just teach us through, this, through the words that I'm going to say today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, the, what, the point, I feel like I've said this before, it's deja vu. Um, when I saw the title, Knowing God, I, I got excited because I've taught on it. And uh, some of you have actually heard those teachings. It's in the Blood Covenant series that I taught on about knowing God. And uh, so when I, but when I read the point, I, did, I felt like it, was, it fell short. Okay, I felt like the point didn't quite get us where we needed to be in this idea of knowing God. And uh, the scripture references really didn't point us to be in, in, uh, in the right direction. Uh, so, I struggled with it. You know, why did the author choose these scriptures in Psalm 119 to talk about knowing God uh, and then I, after a while, I finally figured out that when we talk about this idea of knowing God, that's a new, uh, kind of a new covenant, a New Testament concept, a new covenant concept. Well, for one thing, uh, he was trying to use Old Testament scriptures to teach New Testament truth, which was incomplete. I won't say it was wrong, because it's not, but it, uh, you really can't, the, the, the New Testament is the, is the Old Testament, is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant, right? We've moved from the Old Covenant into the New Covenant. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But, what I, but trying to teach, use the, use the Old Covenant uh, to teach this New Covenant truth is um, just what didn't quite get us there. And you say, well, why do you say that? Well, for one thing, the Old Testament law, uh, the temple observance, the, uh, all the things they did in the Old Covenant, you know, were shadows and pictures at best, okay? Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or Sabbath days. Now, those things were all, all the things the Jews did, Okay? They, uh, they didn't eat certain foods, they didn't drink certain things, they, didn't, uh, they had holy days uh, that they, uh, they, uh, they practiced, the new moon was a big thing, or Sabbath days. All these things were things that were found in the Jewish religion that they practiced in the Old Covenant. And uh, so Paul goes on to say in verse 17, these are things that are shadows of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. So everything in the Old Covenant was a shadow and a picture and a type of Christ. Okay, everything was a, a type of Christ pointing us to Jesus. Uh, but they were just shadows of things. They weren't the complete 
picture. Okay? So when you see a shadow on the floor, you don't really look at the shadow. I mean, you notice the shadow, but you don't really pay attention to it that much. You're looking at what is actually casting the shadow. Okay? What's, what's actually causing this shadow to be there? And that's what this, uh, this what Colossians is saying, that the, all these things in the Old Covenant, all the, all the uh, sacrifice system, the, uh, the law, uh, all of that was casting a shadow, and that shadow was the body that actually produced the shadow was Christ. Okay, it was, it was showing us a picture of Christ. So the Old Testament was the shadow. It was a copy of the original. It revealed that something was coming. And when we see a shadow, we don't look at the shadow, but we, what's casting the shadow? The Old Testament taught us about the Christ that was to come. Okay, It was giving us bits and pieces of information about this, this man that was going to come on the scene who was 100% man, 100% God. He was the Messiah. He was the Jewish hope. He was the hope of the world. He was, uh, he was God come in the flesh. All through the Old Covenant, you can find bits and pieces of that information. And it, makes, it paints a picture for us, or it casts a shadow. And then, but when Jesus, when Jesus came on the scene in uh, the New Covenant, and, you know, all of a sudden they realized, they should have realized that all those shadows and pictures that we saw in the Old Covenant, this is the guy it's talking about. Uh, you guys aren't going to really believe this. I think the train's coming again. I, re I redid, this is my third time to do this. The first time, of course, the audio was, uh, wasn't there. The second time, the video was bad. I was, uh, like, it was like right in my face, uh, and it was kind of off-center. And the train came by. Uh, the first time, the train came by the second time, and I think the train might be coming by again. I'm telling you, they know I'm here. They know I'm teaching this lesson, and uh, they're doing it on purpose. I don't, I, and he just came by. I mean, I'm, I'm redoing this like 45 minutes later and uh, the train just came by and it's coming by again. Okay, anyway, that's enough of that. So, uh, so I realized using Old Testament scriptures even in the Psalms was still a shadow and a type of Christ. Also, the scriptures from the lesson in Psalm 119 took us to the scriptures, the ordinances of God, the judgments of God. They never could take us into that intimate personal relationship with God that the new covenant affords us, okay? Now, I want you to think about what, the, you know, in the old covenant, the Jews, they would, uh, they would pass by the temple every day. You know, they go by the temple, they'd bring offerings and sacrifices, uh, they would, uh, they would, you know, they would, whatever they, whatever reason, whether it was a sin offering, a Thanksgiving offering, they would go, they had business there, but they couldn't go in, Okay? They can never enter in to the very presence of God. The closest they could get was the high priest. He was a representative of the people uh, before God. And even he could only enter the Holy of Holies once a year. Okay? The high priest is the only one that could actually get in the presence of God. that could actually get in the presence of God, but he can only do that one time a year. I'm trying to let this train pass. Wow. And he's actually driving very, very slow, so I think, I think there's a, a conspiracy theory out there with Mississippi Export. Okay. So, so the high, the high priest was the represent, our representative, the Jewish representative before God. He was the only one that got to go into the Holy of Holies, and the priesthood was the only one that got to actually do the ordinances, go through the things that they did. Uh, so, but, but under the New Covenant, we have a new high priest. And his name is Jesus. And he has gone into the Holy of Holies in heaven and he has offered his blood as a sacrifice so that you and I can go into the very presence of God 
We can freely go there and make our petitions known to God. We can, we can talk with God. We don't have to wait on the high priest. We don't have to stand outside the door or outside the temple and, and, and try to peek in, you know. Uh, listen to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so in Hebrews 4, we have this picture of Christ being a, our, our new high priest, okay, and he has gone into the holy place and he's opened a way for us to go in. He sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat and the altar in heaven and now we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Anytime, 24-7, anytime we need to, we can enter the presence of God. This is not something you could do under the Old Covenant. It wasn't something you were allowed to do. But under the New Covenant, we have that ability to know God. Okay, so let's move on to the second point. Uh, the point. The second point I want to make is there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And what I've seen in a lot of churches today is there's an emphasis on knowing about God. You know, they have books, videos, television shows, telling everyone how to know, you know, telling everything, everything about God, you know. Uh, I mean, and people just eat that stuff up. But it really doesn't, uh, there's, not, there's, there's, there's a few but not a whole lot out there about knowing God, about your intimate personal relationship with God. Uh, and this is kind of the same point I made earlier. The Bible uh, gives us pictures and types in the Old Testament. And they tell us about God, but they can't make us love God or explore this relationship with God. The Bible can't force you to do that. We have a free will. We're created that way by God on purpose. And uh, God wants us to choose him just as he's chosen us. Uh, if the Bible could force you to, uh, to accept Christ, if the Bible could force you to live a holy life, then, you know, all we'd have to do is walk around all day with the Bible in our hand. You know, I asked someone one day, I said, have you been born again? Do you know God? And his response was, well, I read the Bible, I go to church, I pray, and I tithe. Okay, that's, that's, that's the Baptist big four, right? Those are the things that if you do all those things, uh, you feel pretty good about yourself. And, but all those things are good things, but they really don't answer the question, do you know God? Uh, these are things we should do, uh, but these are not things that we believe. The problem is they become the main part of our belief system, and we reach a point in which we put our faith in doing these things, which is basically a work doctrine. So we transfer our faith that we have in Christ into our faith in doing the things, doing these, basically these four things, okay? Uh, and it, and, it, and uh, what started out is faith in Jesus, and that's what, that's what Paul said, are you, you know, have you started out by faith, are you made perfect by works, by going through the motions, by playing church, by doing those things that you do? And this is exactly what, um, this, is, this is the point I really want to make, is because there's a lot of people out there that are playing church they're going through the motions, they're doing the big four, but they're not really enjoying that intimate personal relationship with Christ that God in, wants them to enjoy. They're not, they're not letting go and getting deeper with God, okay? So, uh, here's the deal. There's, some, there's something deeper, richer, more intimate waiting for us than just doing the things that we should, that we know we should, Okay? And I don't want to downplay the importance of the Word of God, but just reading the Bible tells us God wants a relationship with us. And we can't even understand this without the Bible. So it's important. So the Bible and Bible study is absolutely necessary. But, you, but that can only lead us to the door. The Bible can get you right to the door, but it can't make you open the door. Okay? It cannot make you open the door. You have to, you have to make that choice on your own. Um. So as we look at this idea of knowing God and knowing about God, I want to give you some, just some general, give you a general example. Um, 
okay, I could write down, I could make a list of things, and this is just an illustration to help you understand what, the point I'm trying to make. I could make a list of things about myself that tells you a whole lot about me. I could write, I could write tell you how tall I am. I'm five foot 11. Uh, my wife's name is Frida. I've got three kids, okay? I've got seven grandkids. I'm 64 years old. My weight is 210 pounds, believe it or not. My favorite food, anything my wife cooks. My favorite color is blue, and so on. I could just make a list, of, a list of things. And if you had that list, you'd know a lot about me. you know a whole lot about me. But if I was in a room with 50 other men that were about my age, about my size, about my hair color, you, you probably wouldn't be able to pick me out of a crowd. Even though you had all that information about me, you probably wouldn't be able to say, okay, that's you. But I've got a dog. His name is Buddy. He's a great Pyrenees. Many of you have seen him. But he doesn't know anything about me. He doesn't know how many children I have. He doesn't know my wife's name. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know how much money I got in my bank account. You know, he doesn't know my street address. He doesn't know anything. But he knows me. You see, if you let Buddy loose in that room, he's going to find me. He's going to eventually find me because he knows me. You see the difference I'm trying to make here? Uh, there are a lot of people out there that read the Bible. I mean, they'll, go, they'll stay in this Bible. They'll read it from cover to cover many times. They'll study it. They'll do all kind of stuff. And they'll know a lot about God. But you have to ask yourself, do they know God? Do they have a personal, deep, intimate relationship with God? And that's, what, that's the point I'm trying to make. We have got to get to the point where we have a relationship with God and that we enjoy that relationship. God is, uh, we are in covenant, in a covenant relationship with God, just like we're in a covenant relationship with our mates. It's intimate, it's personal, it's special. God wants a deep personal relationship with us. The Bible reveals to us that God, uh, what God is like, but it can never substitute for that deep, personal, intimate relationship that God wants and that we need. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. It says, For this is a covenant that I will make... I'm a, okay, Hebrews 8, starting in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he's made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So I want to focus in on verse 11. God tells us in this new covenant, we're not going to have to teach everyone to know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. You see, under the old covenant, if you wanted to know the Lord, you had to go to the priest at the temple. We talked about this already. He was our intermediator, uh, intermediary, our representative before God, and he got to go into the holy place and offer the sacrifice, the incense, the showbread, and all these things teaching about Christ, but we couldn't see it. We couldn't participate in that. We could only stand outside and let the priest experience these things for us. And now while all this is good, you know, I like it, but I kind of feel left out, you know. I mean, I'm just sitting out here not doing anything. The priest is doing it all. Something's missing in this relationship. When can I go inside the holy place or the holy of holies? When am I going to get to go in? Okay, in comes the new covenant. Because of the blood of Jesus, we can all go into the holy place. The veil's been torn. The old covenant has vanished away. Now we can participate. We can know God for ourselves. We can have that personal, intimate relationship with God that they couldn't in the, under the old covenant. See, it's a whole new deal, folks. You got it? Okay. Now you see why I'm saying there's more than reading the Bible, going to church, praying, and tithing. There's more to this relationship with God than doing the big four. Okay? But God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. How convenient. God gave us the Holy Spirit, our comforter, helper, teacher, 
the paraclete, the one that comes alongside of us. And now we can worship in spirit because we have his spirit inside of us. God has made all the arrangements to restore us, restore to us what Adam lost. We don't, we don't have it all yet, but when we get our new glorified bodies, we will have it all. Okay, so that's, you know, we looked at the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Now let's look at this idea of what does that word know mean? What does that word know mean? And this is another issue in the church because we think the word means knowledge. Uh, you know, and sometimes it does. But in this case, it means so much more than just knowledge, head knowledge. God wants us to one. God didn't want us to wonder about this, so he gave us an example in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 4, I want to read that to you because it's an important Scripture. In verse 1 it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. See, I told you it was intimate. When we're talking about knowing, it's way more than head knowledge. This is intimate. Two become one by the shedding of blood. That's blood covenant. Okay, that's blood covenant. Adam and Eve became one by the shedding of blood. There's nothing more intimate in the human experience than the marriage consummation. God meant this to be holy, sacred, pure, and innocent. A perfect picture of our union with God through the blood of Christ. You see, marriage uh, is the picture that God has given us in our human experience to understand the depth of our relationship with him. And that's why marriage is supposed to be holy. It's supposed to be sacred. It's supposed to be something that's set apart. And the world and we ourselves have made marriage cheap. We've made it disposable. You can just throw it away when you get tired of it. We've made it uh, just, just something cheap. You know, something of not a whole lot of value. Something, actually, there's a lot of people that go into marriage with uh, a get out, you know, plan B. How do I get out of this if it don't work out? They do prenups. They do, uh, you know, I mean, if you've got to have a prenup to get married, then don't get married. If you can't trust the person you're marrying enough, then don't get married. It's, it's not the right person for you. Um, so, but marriage, God intended marriage to paint a picture for us about our relationship with him and the enemy and the world has done everything they can to make marriage uh, unacceptable, you know, disposable. Uh, a marriage, marriage has become a contract, not a covenant. Okay, and there's a difference. There's a difference. So, uh, but in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus makes this statement. He says, I and my Father are one. Now, if Jesus is one with the Father, and we are in Christ, then we are also one with the Father because we're in Christ. We are heirs with God and joint heirs with Jesus. Why do you think the Bible calls us the bride of Christ? You know? Uh, you think that was just flowery speech? No, it's, that's exactly who we are. That's exactly who you are. I want, to say, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 5 with me. We'll close with this scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll start in verse 29. It says, For no man has ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord the church. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Paul's writing, and he said, 
And he tells us in verse 31, that for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one. That's what I said earlier. Two become one by the shedding of blood. Okay? In verse 32, said, he said, man, this is a great mystery. Marriage is a great mystery. Well, why is it a mystery? Because it's a picture of our relationship with Christ. He says, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Because he says, marriage, human marriage on the earth is a picture of spiritual marriage that takes place between those that are born again, those that enter into uh, this relationship with Christ. It's personal, it's intimate, it's spiritual. And uh, that's what, that's the whole point of this lesson today is when you talk about knowing God, it's, it's deep, guys. You've got to let go of some stuff to know God, okay, to enter in. If you, you know, you say, well, I'm born again. I've got the Spirit of God living in me. Uh, yeah, but are you holding on to something? You got your, you know, you got your uh, get out of jail free card. You know, you got plan B in your back pocket. If, if, this, if, this, if this Christian thing don't work out, this religious stuff don't work out, I'm going to go this other route. You know, it, you know, it's kind of like when you got married. I mean, when you got married, you, you were supposed to give up everything, abandon everything, your family, you know, and cling to, to your wife, cling to your husband. Uh, that is what uh, a marriage is, complete, total dependence on one another. And that's the picture that God's painting for us here with Christ. Our, we're supposed to abandon everything and cling to God. Complete, total de uh, dependence upon Him. And that's, when you reach that point, then you can say, I know God. You know, that's what it's all about, about knowing God, is abandoning yourself, abandoning the things that you're holding on to and clinging to God. Now is the time to know God. We need to start the journey. We need to start the journey. Find the time to nurture this love relationship between you and Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word, God. Thank you, God, for... Uh, we have this opportunity to have such a deep personal relationship. God, there are people in the world that don't even understand, that don't know. God, uh, they're bound up by laws and regulations and rules. And God, uh, you bring freedom and peace and joy. God, as, but we need to abandon ourselves. We need to let go. We're, we're holding on to so much junk, God, because we're afraid. But perfect love casts out all fear. So I pray that you, that you, you pour out your perfect love on us so that we could be fearless, God, and we could walk with you. We could walk and see, see your, the power of the resurrection working in and through us. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for ministering to us today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.